What's up everyone, welcome to 2017, this is Press Start Seb. I spent the last bit of last year playing Final Fantasy XV feverishly, uh, but is it as good as I was hoping? I want to start this video with a bunch of disclaimers. The first little bit, I'm not going to do any spoilers, but this is going to be a spoiler-filled... Uh, review and kind of discussion. I waited to release it till now so that I could kind of talk about things without worrying about ruining it for people who may not have beaten it by now. And also this is the first kind of big installment of Final Fantasy that I've played and beat. Up until this point I've played almost all of Final Fantasy 13, um, but didn't beat it. Not a huge fan of turn-based com uh, combat. So a lot of People who are huge Final Fantasy fans are going to be like, what are you talking about? The old way's better and it doesn't feel like a Final Fantasy game. So I'm coming from a place where I don't necessarily know what a true Final Fantasy game feels like. So I'm not going to have a lot of those uh, biases. So overall, I kind of want to say I fucking love this game. This game is outstanding. It, it, when I first played it, I was consistently going, is this my favorite game ever? I don't know. Uh, up until this point, Last of Us has been my favorite game. And that game means a whole lot to me, and it's such a different experience. And so I kind of put them on these two different piers. But by the end of the game, when I got the whole experience, I finally completed the story after 44 hours, I believe it was. I finished, I took it all in, and I can conclusively say, favorite game of all time. That being said, this game is, to no stretch of the imagination, perfect. It's very much a broken game. It's also a masterpiece, but there's a lot of things kind of holding it back from, I think, it unanimously being thought of as a masterpiece. Now, this can range from small, like, graphical problems to full-blown sections of the story that don't make any sense, are completely looked past, and this is really prominent in the end of the game. Some characters' motivations are really, really vague. Um, characters that you think are going to have a huge role um, in the development of the story, in the development of this kind of feud, and the reclaiming of the throne, um, don't or do, but everything important they, they do is kind of off screen, you don't even see it. But I want to get just to the kind of basics of just playing the game. The game looks just phenomenal. The world is kind of rich with things to do. It looks really pretty. The, the geography is varied enough. You have like a desert kind of barren area near Hammerhead, and then this nice lush greenery um, in the Duskayan or whatever it's called. You have the swamps in the northwest. And that huge volcano thing in the far, far west. It reminded me a lot of playing um, Ocarina of Time on N64. And you can kind of go to Kakariko Village and Kokori Forest and Death Mountain and Zora's Domain. There were so much different things going on. It was super exciting um, to explore it all. And it felt very, uh, felt different and varied consistently. And so it, it, I really, really enjoyed that. But it's not without its faults. Sometimes traversing the landscape is really boring and monotonous because driving the car is essentially an on-rail segment. It's not... I didn't know what to expect. I didn't expect to be able to go driving off and fucking jumping off mountains and stuff because it would kind of break the immersion of, of what this game is trying to do. But at the same time, I expected it to be more of an act... you were actively doing something. I know Ignis drives a car a lot, so it's kind of like you control Noctis, so if you're in the back, you're kind of just on for the drive anyway. But it kind of took something that was really neat because you really want to stare at and look at and admire the landscape. Um, but there's no real incentive to do it other than a couple conversations, listening to some of the old Final Fantasy tracks. Um, and AP. Uh, if you got the Ascension grid that gives you AP for long distances in the car. So yes, the environment environment is great. Now we'll move on to um, combat. The combat in this game is, it seems very surface level, like it's really simple. One button to attack one button um, to dodge, and then you can lock on and warp strike. Um, not super complicated, and you can change your weapons according to a bunch of different things, and then magic also can come into effect. But the more and more I kind of stewed with this game and played and encountered enemy after enemy after enemy, this the combat can be very, very deep. Certain items and certain um, elements are good or bad against certain enemies, so you're consistently trying to vary your the, the items you have equipped, to handle the situation that you're presented with. And that's super fucking cool, because you're not just picking the strongest weapon you have and hacking every enemy. I had one of the most powerful swords in the game, and against certain enemies, it's, uh, I might as well be fucking slapping them in the face. If an enemy isn't particularly weak against that item or that element, 
it's really an uphill battle. You, you will win. You don't have to kind of take this into, but if you want to play the game effectively um, and maximize the experience and, and the time it takes to destroy an enemy, uh, you, you, you want to get into some of the intricacies of the combat. In addition to being really kind of satisfying and deep and um, you can kind of, it has a bunch of layers, the combat just looks really pretty. When you kind of unlock the Warp Strike ability in the air step and you can consistently air step around your enemies, this is really, really helpful on some of the big enemies because a lot of the enemies have a huge sense of scale. You and your party have these little specks kind of on the ground and these big birds or dragons or whatever it is are towering over you and it really, it, it, it's, it intensifies the camaraderie with the four guys because you're consistently uh, battling to take down these enemies that are so big and so grand and could fucking sneeze and kill you, they're that big. Now I had just mentioned the sense of camaraderie and now that is in essence, the, my favorite part of this game. The four characters, Noctis, Gladiolus, Ignis, and Prompto, are absolutely believable, and you you no. feel like you're a part of that Stop. friendship. Please. Big disclaimer, though. I played this in Japanese with English subtitles, because the English voice actors in this game, they fucking suck. I, I've watched videos, I've seen other people's playthroughs, I just could not get behind it. They seem very one-note. Noctis is super whiny and... and bitchy, and, and Ignis has this weird British accent, oh, fuck the recipe, oh. Um, Gladiolus is just consistently like, oh, I'm big and tough, and it, it's just, it gets played out very quick. And I understand that um, a lot of people don't want to consistently read when they're playing, especially in the intense combat sections that consistently look down at the font, and I, I can sympathize with that. I watch a lot of anime, so that's not really a huge problem for me. I'm kind of instinctively kind of looking down there anyway. But that being said, I think the story and the characters resonated with me so, so, so much because the voice acting in Japanese was just tremendous. You know, I watched uh, the Brotherhood anime beforehand, so again, I've heard their voices in Japanese first, so it's kind of how I've associated those characters. Those characters have these voices, and playing in English would just sound foreign to me. It wouldn't sound like what they should um, I guess sound like. Now a lot changed from the demos to the actual final product. Certain things like being able to do your own special moves is actually now um, a link bar with your teammates and so you can call upon them to do their special moves. And I think this is really, it was really important to kind of solidify the friendship and the teamwork into the combat itself. Instead of not just kind of just being a super tank and the three other guys just kind of being controlled by the and doing whatever, you can call upon them get prompted to shoot a guy, or Ignis to analyze the weakness, or regroup and, and re, um, refresh everyone's health. So there's a lot of, it just, it pulls it all together so well between the characters, their friendship, and the actual game mechanics. And this is particularly prevalent in the fact that each of the guys have their own skills. Noctis likes to fish, Prompt loves the photography, um, Ignis likes to cook, and Gladiolus just picks stuff up. Survival skills. This gives each character their own sense of personality, their own sense of identity, and their own sense of believability. And my favorite part of the game by far is Prompto's photographs. It's because, and so I had always thought Last of Us as being the staple of storytelling and my favorite game ever, and this game takes the cake because of things like the photography. The story is the same for everyone, and they're all going to experience the same things. But with those photographs, those photographs are uniquely mine. My experiences and my experiences alone are being documented through those photographs. So when I look back on them, it's like, I remember doing this and doing this. And it seems like it's my journey that I went on with these characters. And for someone else to look at my photographs, it wouldn't be the same as looking at their own. Um, it's, it's kind of separates it apart and makes it kind of the player's own experience and their own journey that no one else can kind of replicate. Whereas a game like The Last of Us, for example, every story is going to be the same, every character, every every player is going to get the same experience no matter what. That's not inherently good or bad, I just thought that was a really, really interesting thing to do in a game of this magnitude. And again, the things like um, Ignis loving to cook, because I was consistently looking for new things that I could help him find new recipes, and then um, the new recipes would obviously give us boosts and stat buffs for the next day. If I knew I was going to go explore a dungeon, I made sure that I had the best the best ingredients to make the best meals to maximize my own um, chance of survival. And going to the dungeons, there's so much to do in this game. I'm like 78 hours in and I haven't, I've hardly scratched the surface. I've done so many hunts and there's so much more that I've come in to, to uncover. I've got all the dungeons left. I've, it's just unbelievable. There's so much content in this game um, 
And this is where things start to get kind of negative. In addition to being negative, this is kind of where we get into the spoiler territory. There's so much to do in this game. The gameplay, the expansiveness, it's huge, it's vast, it's immersed, but the story kind of lacks because of it. Now, I'm, I'm, I kind of look at the story in a different way from most people. I've got a very good friend of mine who didn't like the first, maybe, three quarters of this game because he didn't feel like it was story-driven enough. And I'm sure from previous Final Fantasies, that's probably the case, because you're consistently getting the story told to you. But in the case of this game, you're four friends on a road trip um, to marry Luna and reclaim the throne, and they wouldn't really get told story at all other than situations like reading the newspaper, checking the radio, or encountering conversations from civilians that are talking about shit. The coolest thing was that I would go into a diner and I'd turn on the radio and it would talk about a place getting raided that I just did. And so it kind of, it, it, it connected the story with the gameplay. You're not getting told story, you're playing through the story. And that was a really big um, thing that I enjoyed about this game, is I didn't consistently feel like they were cramming story down my throat. It felt like I was going through the story organically like these characters would. If Insomnia got attacked, they wouldn't know because they weren't there. They had to find out days later from, boom, the newspaper. And that's how the story is consistently delivered for the first half of the game. And so that's also really cool, but also super annoying, because a lot of pivotal scenes seem to happen off screen away from the four guys. Situations like uh, Luna's brother and what his motivations are, and why he's bad but good, and then in the end he's good and trying to help Noctis. But if you watch King's Glaive, like this, the motivations for characters don't match up, and the reason why their motivations change don't happen on screen um, in any real capacity. Now they did say they were going to patch some of the game to make some of these motivations more clear and some of these character developments more um, fleshed out, which is cool. But it kind of gives me this bitter feeling, like I just beta tested the story for a game that wasn't ready. But it's it's, it's so unique that even with these flaws, even with character motivations that don't make sense, even with a story that's not super tight. I love this game. I love the characters of Noctis. I love uh, I love the villain. The villain is super interesting, super captivating, and his motivations make sense. And in many instances, Arden does fulfill his his wish. He wants to destroy the the, the line of kings. He wants to destroy the ring and have uh, the kingdom kind of collapse. And with Noctis having to sacrifice himself to destroy Arden, he essentially does um, end the line of Lucis. So it's a super unique take on, a, on an enemy who's helping you and you don't know why, but you know something's fishy about him, especially if you watch Kingsley, you know who he is. Um, but it creates this, this tension throughout the storyline of, you're helping me, and I, I can't figure out why you would, but I know you shouldn't be. And then we have to talk about the finale of the game. I've never, never, ever, 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 ever cried during a video game until this game. And, and this game made me cry. Not like one tear, like, ooh. Like, <laughs> like fucking bust out. I was, I was a mess. I was a wet rag after the credits roll. So as, as you know, Noctis has to sacrifice himself. His dad gives him that last fucking blow, <laughs> stabs him. You're up in that weird limbo land. You kill uh, Arden. The ring explodes. Noctis essentially dies. And then it goes back to that scene of all the guys around the campfire. And this is an area of hot contention for a lot of people because you see Noctis playing with his hands a lot, but he's not wearing the ring, and you know before going to Insomnia he definitely was. So it kind of creates this weird thing of speculation. Are they all dead? Is Noctis dead? Is he really dead? What's the situation? This is crazy, this is crazy, this is crazy. But when they all had that scene, and Noctis is saying, you know, I've really accepted my fate, I understand what I have to do, but now that I have all you guys here, it's almost too much to bear to sacrifice it all. It's a really, really powerful moment um, that I wasn't expecting. When that when the credits rolled, I thought that was that was it. And you had the lovely scene with uh, Noctis and Luna um, wedding at the end. Um, whether or not that actually happened, it was fan service, or they wed in the afterlife, because there is still that huge fucking hole um, in the in the throne room where uh, Noctis warps out to fight Arden down at the Citadel base. So as you can see, this game gets me super, super amped. Um, it's not perfect. The DLC is going to probably fix a lot of that, and I'm okay with it. I'm so many hours in this game, I'm not going to stop. I got I'm everything about this game I want. I bought the collector's edition book that comes with the map and everything, so I want to, I want 100% this game. I'm, I'm two trophies away at the moment from platinuming it, and 
I'm not going to stop at that. I'm super excited what you guys have to think about this game. What do you think about the story, the gameplay? Do you agree with me and, and kind of, you like the story, how it's told in a different way? Or do you agree with the friend of mine who's a really Final Fantasy purist who thinks the story should have been more uh, tight? Also, who's your favorite of the four characters? I love Noctis, but if I had to pick one of the other guys, it'd probably be Gladio, but Prompto is so good too. It's so hard, all the characters are super endearing, but Noctis is my main man. I want to know about you guys, who's your favorite character. Let me know in the comment section below. More Final Fantasy gameplay, everything, spoiler talks, talking about the DLC. I'm going to keep this game going for a very long time, so make sure you subscribe to stay tuned to that. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care.